As many of you know, I am a preacher's kid. My dad was a minister of the United Church of Christ. And uh, preacher's kids had a bad reputation. Uh, mothers warned their kids, uh, their, their girls, about boys who had come from preacher's families. Uh, so we've earned some notoriety, unearned, I can tell you. Uh, but I do think that Billy the Kid's father, the Billy the Kid, the outlaw, his father was a preacher. So maybe that's where it comes from. But on the whole, I think we preachers' kids have been pretty decent human beings. The truth is that preachers and their spouses and their kids live in glass houses. Their conduct is always open to review, always the subject of somebody's curiosity. Somehow people expect exemplary behavior out of the preacher and the preacher's family, especially the preacher's kids. Every aspect of their lives ought to be open for scrutiny. Uh, the Neighborhood Watch program was in effect long before it became something that you put up a sign for. And our three children had a double curse. Not only was their father a preacher, but their mother was an English teacher in the school system uh, that the kids went to. Uh, not comfortable for some of our kids, uh, at least not initially. Our oldest child, our one and only daughter, paved the way for the two boys. She didn't like the fact that some referred to her as Saint Rebecca. <laughs> for she was a very good kid just by nature. Uh, she just was a good kid. And the boys followed in that, those same footsteps. So I'm happy to report that all three of our kids have survived. They've survived well. Uh, this preacher's kid syndrome. And they've grown into very responsible adults. Thank the Lord. Well, friends, I welcome you to the glass house that I have lived in all my life. For you live in the same glass house. I believe that this distinctive privilege is not reserved for preachers and their kids, but the mantle we all wear as Christians is that we are up for review for those around us. Our text comes from the third chapter of John's Gospel. It begins with the famous words from John 3.16, a portion of scripture that many of us have committed to memory a long time ago, and a portion so familiar that if you just say John 3.16, people know what that is going to say. I believe that John 3.16 is the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ in its most efficient form. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that those who believe in him should not perish, but have eternal life. When you pan a crowd at many sporting events, you will see one or more posters among the people there that will hold up a sign and all it will say is John 3.16, reminding us of this portion of scripture. And as famous and as, and as wonderful as that portion of, of scripture is, there really is a bit more to that chapter in John's gospel. So you need to read what comes after John 3, 16. From John 3, 17. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. This is the judgment, that light has come into the world and people love darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light and do not come to the light so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done 
in God. Well, what does it mean to live in the light? And what are the implications of living in a glass house? What does it mean for a Christian to live out in the open as a Christian? Throughout the history of our country, though with one just notable exception, about 40% of the people who live in this country claim some affiliation with the Christian church, 40%. About 40% are somehow involved in the life of a congregation, give financial support to some church, volunteer time, and bother to attend, 40%. Perhaps you thought that that was not the case, that the percentage was much greater than that. Certainly you would think that in the colonial days, everyone was a practicing member of a church, and you would be wrong. Those first pilgrims and Puritans, who are the forefathers and foremothers of the United Church of Christ, came to this country trying to create a religious utopia. They came on the Mayflower. Most of them had that kind of an intent. Soon after, a lot more people came. And most of them came because this was a place of opportunity. This was a place where they could immigrate and create a new life. This was a place they could escape from whatever was their demons back there and get a new start. It didn't take long before this country had about 40% of the people who showed up on a Sunday morning for worship. They were attracted by the freedoms and the opportunities, the sense of adventure, but they were not all religious people by any means. Our Christian churches, especially in New England, were very visible and influential. You go to New England and one of those congregational clapboard churches is either on the uh, town square or very near it. We were part of the establishment. Only 40% of the people bothered to come. Up until just recently, most of that 40% of the people who were church people were mainline people, people who populated churches like this one, who had rather contemporary, uh, orthodox kinds of ways of believing and practicing. And we had an influence beyond our numbers. In some uh, communities, the preacher's sermon was reprinted on Monday morning in the local newspaper The percentage of those persons um, stayed at 40% until the late 1940s, all through the 1950s, and into the beginning of the 1960s, when there was a virtual influx of people into our buildings. We reached almost 60% in the late 1950s, early 1960s, taking the church seriously enough to come. Perhaps you remember those days when the buildings were bursting and full. We were building new educational units to take care of the kids, and we had expansive plans for what the future would be as if that trend were going to continue. The trick to growing a church in those days was not so much a trick. It was just making sure that the doors were open on a Sunday morning so that those who were going to show up could get in. They were seeking us. They were looking for us. And all we needed to do was to open the door and give a welcoming smile. I remember those days, do you not? We call those the golden days of the church in our time. And perhaps you've noticed that those days are now gone. When I graduated from seminary in 1963, I assumed that this pattern that had been building, building, building was going to continue, and it did not. Every year since 1963, the percentage of people participating in Christian churches has declined. 
I am not only responsible for that, <laughs> but it happened during my watch. It happened during my watch. So the percentage continued to drop from 1963 to today, and it is back to 40%. 40%. What it had been traditionally in this country for a long, long time. And there are many people who grieve about what has happened to us. And there are many fingers pointed as to who was responsible. Was it lay leadership? Was it clergy leadership? What was going on? The classrooms that used to be filled with eager children are no longer filled. Church pews that used to be filled now need to have uh, a dusting. Church growth strategies today rest more on making sure that the church doors open for they're not coming to us as much as they used to by any means. Instead of them finding us, we are trying to find ways to find them. To make known to them who we are, what we stand for, what we believe, what we're about. How we're trying to enrich the lives of our communities how we're trying to help people find meaning in their own journey of life, and how we're trying to be Jesus' people in our own time. So far, 60% of the people have not, uh, have not been impressed. Either they tried the church and got burned out or offended by something and they have given up on the church, or they have grown up without the church. The majority of teenagers and people in their early 20s have never been in a church building with the possible exception of a funeral or a wedding. So that's our new reality. The culture no longer funnels, funnels people to us. It is no longer the thing to do on a Sunday morning, seek out a church. Sunday has become a very cluttered day for more and more people. And there's a lot of competition out there in this culture in which we live for how you're going to spend a Sunday. There are many people for whom Sunday is no longer the first day of the week. It isn't the first day of the week. It's the last day of the weekend. Sunday is not the day set aside to thank God for the gift of life, for the gift of the creation that we share, to remember all of the things that God has done for us. That used to be the first day of the week. That's when God rested from all the creation. Sunday is the last day of the weekend. It's the day you do everything else you need to do that you haven't already done in order to get to ready for the first day of the week, which is Monday. Because Monday is the first day of the week. It's the week of work. It's the week of school. It's the week on many calendars. First day of the week, Monday. So, that's the reality. And the primary learning for me, for all of that, is that we have a huge evangelizing task we who are the 40%. I doubt if in our lifetimes it'll ever move much more than that 40%. But we've got to give a witness to what we know, what we've come to believe, and how we've tried to order our lives. So friends, taking the clue from John's Gospel, I believe we need to live in glass houses. That our lives need to be open books to people. That we need to say and do things grounded in our Christian faith, which people can connect then to say, I wonder why they say that why they do that, what gives them that, that, that compulsion to act, to do what they do. Meaning that we ought to be more forgiving than anyone else 
and that we need to be more forgiving than anybody else. We need to be more gracious than anyone else. We need to be more understanding of the failings of others and find a way of moving beyond that to say you're still part of the family. I believe we must live out there in the open in our glass houses, inviting people to analyze if we are onto something that is missing in their own lives, that we seem to have something about us that says, we found something. We're on a journey that has future all over it. Something that brings hope and life and love to this world. I'm not speaking about street corner evangelism, buttonholing people on the street with invasive questions about their salvation, which almost always puts them on the defensive. But I am into holding us, all of us, to a higher way of living because we are Christians. Because we have studied the words of Jesus and they have transformed us. They have given us a different way of spending our time on this good earth. Preaching sermons not so much with words but with actions. Living distinctively in a selfish and materialistic culture which says we're not part of that as much as maybe others are because we know that to be bankrupt in a dead end way in the long run, maybe even in the short run. So the bottom line is that what you say does make a difference if you profess to be a Christian. What you say does make a difference for you represent Christ the risen one in what you say, the words you choose, the way you respond to others. It needs to be distinctive. You're a Christian. What you do does make a difference if you profess to be a Christian. For people who know that you spend time in this building will wonder what difference it has made. How are you different from the others? What have you learned? What are you committed to? That gives evidence in how you go about living your daily life. It's not for us to be able to sh uh, hide in the shadows, to cover our light under a bushel. You see, for the stakes are too high. And people are looking for what we found in Jesus. And the word is, world is needy. And we've got a chance to spread a good word. For the gospel is good news. So I invite you to embrace living in a glass house, living an exposed life, inviting people to uh, take a good look at the way you do it, how you spend your time, what your priorities are, what you say and do. This world needs a lot of forgiveness, needs a lot of love, needs a lot of grace. And those are things God wants us to be about. So don't hide people. Be people of the good news. And may it be a joyful good news. God wins. And we are part of the good news. Amen.